If you started piano as an adult or you came back to it as an adult, it's very likely that at some point you've taken the time to imagine yourself playing a favourite piece of music and it's quite possible that in that fantasy there is an audience of some description. And it's lovely to imagine that someday we'll be able to do that. But also you may have had the experience of deciding, well actually no, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do an exam or I'm going to play this piece in front of my friends or whatever it is and immediately you find that the feeling changes, doesn't it? Because as soon as it becomes a real scenario, our anxiety kicks in and suddenly it's very uncomfortable. And if you're anything like me, you follow through, you get to the piano ready to play your piece and suddenly it's as if you've never seen it before in your life. What is it? When I was about 14, I had a teacher <laughs> who was a, a quite a good teacher, but she was an absolute battle axe. We were all terrified of her. She was about 70 and she chain smoked and she was very grumpy. And in a lesson one day, I was preparing for an exam that was coming up soon, and in our lesson one day, she asked me if I would play my exam pieces for the first year students in the school, and I politely declined. I broke out in a sweat immediately and said, no, thank you. And she said, fine, no, no worries. And the following week, I came back for my lesson, and there was a sign on the door of the piano room, and it said, we're going to have our lesson today in the common room, go down to the common room. So down I went and got to the common room, opened the door, and there were the assembled first years waiting to hear my exam pieces. So I had no warning whatsoever. 40 years later, I am still traumatized <laughs> by that experience. I remember in a blur of sitting down, not being able to play anything, getting up from the piano and going to leave and being pushed back to the piano to finish and I think I managed to stumble through one piece and I bolted, I made a run for it. I ran straight to the principal's office and asked to be assigned to a different piano teacher and she took one look at me and went, okay. We did eventually uh, patch things up and in the conversation that followed that, you know, she offered to teach me some quite advanced pieces and focus on performance and lots of uh, new stuff and she showed me some boogie woogie and all kinds of things and I got very excited actually we were going to do some really fun stuff on the piano. Unfortunately very shortly afterwards I had to change school and in the new school I had the option of taking piano lessons from a nun who was in charge of the music department in this particular school and immediately I knew that if I said yes to this I would be in the church every Sunday playing hymns at mass and that to me was as bad as having to play for the first year, so I couldn't do it. So I said no, and I actually stopped taking lessons at about age 15, and that was it for 20 years. So that one very, very bad experience frightened me so badly that I actually dropped piano for a couple of decades. Because, of course, I left home and I, I didn't have access to a piano as I was uh, in university and working and whatnot. So it was a good 20 years before I was in a position to have a, a, a piano again and start taking lessons. And that stage fright stayed with me, so much so that when I went back to university to do a, a degree in, in music, in my final year exam uh, and playing a programme for the three professors in the music department, I was so terrified of that that they just barely passed me. They were they they passed me because they they knew I had done the work and actually was capable. But the, I, my stage fright then was so bad that my hands were doing this as I was trying to play, so I couldn't. I could barely get through the program. Later on, I went back again to college to do a master's in music therapy, and that was a really revealing experience because as a music therapist you're expected to be comfortable singing and playing a guitar, apart from a piano. And as I was learning to do that, I became much more relaxed about performance. And there was one evening when I found myself actually at an open mic with my guitar and ready to sing, and feeling very nervous, of course, but realizing that it was a completely different feeling to the massive stage fright, the massive anxiety that I was having when I tried to perform piano versus what I was going to do with a guitar and just singing in front of, of people. What I realised was that singing and strumming a guitar at the same time are far less complicated than trying to play a piano and everything that, that goes with it. And it was this, the simpler requirements made the whole experience much easier, much more enjoyable. So that's my story. But in retrospect, having that experience and dropping piano and then coming back to it as an adult and scrambling to catch up and having to learn how to learn, I suppose it's what made me the teacher I am today and why I focus so much on beginner students and people in, up to maybe inter intermediate level where I can really make a difference because of the process I've had to go through myself. So every cloud has a silver lining, but uh, I don't think I'd want to repeat any of those experiences. So that's a true story. And now I want you to imagine a story and I want you to put yourself into this scenario. So I want you to imagine that you're booked to play a concert. It doesn't matter what level piano player you are at the moment, you're booked to play a concert. Though your warm up act is um, Evgeny Kissin or Martha Argerich or some absolute megastar of the piano and you're going on afterwards. The crowd is out there and they are booing Martha. They're throwing tomatoes at her, they hate her. Uh, nothing that she does can please them, but you're on next. 
she comes out, she passes by, she shrugs her shoulders and she says, good luck. And out you go. So this crowd hates you already. They hate you on sight. But here's what you're going to play. And that's your entire performance. Do you think you could do that? In the horrible circumstances you're in, no matter how terrified you are, do you think you could go out and play a five finger scale of C? Because I'm guessing you could, and you're probably laughing and going, well, of course I could, that's very simple. But the reason you can do that is because there's nothing to remember there except that one piece of information. It's a five finger scale of C, I know how to do that. So what I'm getting at is that when we try to perform a piece of music in front of an audience, be it one family member or an assembled group of people come to hear a studio recital, if you have the information here, then you can translate it into your fingers. So what I want to talk about in this video are the two stages of preparation for performance and how to not overcome stage fright because you can't. Nobody has ever <laughs> overcome stage fright. Everybody gets it. You may already have heard the story of Vladimir Horowitz's horrible stage fright that he suffered throughout his life. He went into retirement and came out of retirement after about 10 years to play a concert. And before the concert, he was so terrified of what might happen that he had to be dragged from his dressing room. And in the video, I'll see if I can find it and show it here. It shows him walking confidently onto stage. But what you don't see is the fact that before he came into view, he was actually being pushed onto stage because of his fright and you may have seen the the footage of concert pianist whose name escapes me but I'll look it up uh, who arrived to play a con piano concerto with an orchestra in I think in Holland and uh, realized as the orchestra began that she had rehearsed the wrong piece and the piece that she was required to play that day was one that she hadn't played in over a year and you see on her face the absolute horror of what is happening and she communicates it to the conductor and he's quite funny he says he basically says i have complete faith in you you played this last year you can do it today and she did so those are two absolute legends uh, who managed to overcome their terror to deliver wonderful performances so there are two stages to preparing for performance one is the preparation and there is no substitute for preparing thoroughly for a performance no matter how simple the piece is and what often happens and the reason why you think you know a piece of music you go to play it for somebody else and it immediately falls apart is because we actually end up fooling ourselves really when we're practicing a piece of music because we can play it in private when we're relaxed and we can just flow through it on, on the piano but we are relying on muscle memory to do that and we're not involving this at all and we're probably not involving our ears very much either so we want to involve those three elements when we're preparing so muscle memory, of course, is very important. Your fingers need to know what to do pretty much automatically. But if you're just allowing your fingers to lead the way and hoping for the best, it will go wrong because the conditions in your practice room are very different to the conditions on a stage or in public or just when there's somebody else in the room with you. The reason for that is our brains will register everything that's happening in our body and make an assessment of what might be going on. So as you start to play in front of somebody or, or if you anticipate playing in front of somebody, you start to feel a little bit nervous. Now, now your brain doesn't know what's going on outside and it's a very ancient organ and particularly the part of the brain that's at the back of your head in the brain stem it's responsible for constantly scanning to see is there danger here and if it starts to read signals that there is danger present it just automatically assumes that there's a bear coming out of the woods or there's a saber toothed tiger has just entered the cave or whatever it doesn't know the difference so it prepares you to fight or flight now, if you're going to get away from a, a predatory animal, you need to be able to run fast. So, so the blood in the body needs to go to your limbs to be able to, to move fast enough. Uh, everything else gets shut down. Uh, we break out in a cold sweat. The adrenaline rises in our, in our body and everything starts to stack up against us being able to concentrate on a complex task. Because running away from a tiger is not a complex task. It's a very simple focused activity run. So what we need to do is be prepared for that and able to carry out complex activities in a state of fear. If you've ever looked at videos on Navy SEAL training, um, you'll know that they put themselves through terrifying situations again and again and practice complex maneuvers while they're doing it so that when it comes to the real deal, they're able to just go through the maneuvers that they need to do, like getting out of a submerged helicopter or whatever it is when they're under pressure so that when the time comes, they're fully prepared and they can go on to automatic pilot and it, it just happens. We don't do that when we're practicing. We're not thinking about uh, being afraid. We haven't factored that in. We just think, well, if I know this piece of music, I, you know, if I can play it in the practice room, I should be able to play it here with this person listening. But we don't allow for the change to our physiological condition that happens when we start to get nervous and that can really spiral it can get out of control and block our 
mental functioning. So the preparation itself can be broken into two areas itself. So one is preparation of the piece of music that we're planning to play and making sure that we really do know it. We don't just know it with our fingers, that we know it here. We know the structure of it, we know the key it's in, we know the time signature. If I were to ask you to think of a piece of music now that you might consider playing for somebody, something that you know very well, that you're working on at the moment, and I'm going to ask you without looking at your music or looking at the piano, what are the first two notes in it? And maybe you do know that, but tell me what are the first notes in the second phrase? What's the chord progression? What key is it in? What structure do, does it have? Does it modulate? How does it modulate? In what bar does it modulate? Where are the cadences? What are the highest and lowest notes? Can you sing the melody? And so on and so forth. There are so many aspects to any piece of music and if you can't answer them without reference to the actual page or without playing it through then arguably even if you can play it through when you're relaxed you don't actually know this piece of music. So in order to prepare something for performance we need to go much much deeper. You do need to be frankly able to write the music out from memory or at least name the notes from memory. If you want to be absolutely certain of being able to produce a performance you need to do what professional performers do and they do prepare to that level. So if, if you're starting to learn music now or you're not too far into your journey then now is a really good time when you're working on simple pieces of music to start learning how to analyze it and understand what the structure is and understand the relationship of the tonic to dominant for example and the chord progressions that are in it and make sure you understand how all that is working and if, if you don't understand it from looking at your music go through it with your teacher ask them to help you prepare it to that level so that when you do go to perform the piece you're again you're not just relying on what your fingers might be able to remember but you're able to see your way through the, the music you know its shapes and its patterns the other aspect of preparation is performance itself so we need to practice how to perform so I would suggest that th if this is something you're interested in doing that you get a buddy to work with a spouse a child a parent a friend and have them maybe watch this video first and then sit down and work out a little program of performances that you're going to give for that person now the very first performance should be something as simple as what I just played there five finger scale of C because what you want to do is habituate this idea of performing for somebody else it's like a what do they call it exposure therapy if you're phobic to spiders you start by looking at a picture of a spider and you gradually build up to the point where you're able to hold a spider in your hand. So a performance, because so many of us are phobic about performance, and we should treat it the same way. You want to expose yourself gradually to performance opportunities. So find a friendly person in your life and have them sit with you and listen to you perform. You start off very, very simply, a few notes. The next one maybe should be, can you do a scale of C? for example. Then find the easiest piece in your book, you know, something that you started off in the first couple of pages, something you're absolutely sure you can play, you know, because you know it's a very simple, you know, pattern. It might be C to G, C to G, something like that. Something that you're able to describe the pattern of without actually playing it. And go from there and gradually, very gradually build up your tolerance for performance. And even if you're an intermediate or an advanced player, if you find that you are phobic of performance, then that is still the same, same way you want to start. You want to start with those few notes, a scale, a few chords, building up to a very, very elementary piece and going from there. If you're a grade eight, you may find even a grade one piece is a challenge to perform. It may not be a challenge to learn, but you might find it takes time to learn it in depth enough so that you can actually perform it reliably. So we said preparation is the first part of getting ready for a performance, but the second part is the performance itself. And often the worst part of that is the anticipation of it, isn't it? If you're doing an exam, it's the moment when you're sitting outside the door waiting for the examiner to call you in is the worst part of the entire process. If you're sitting in a recital waiting for your turn to play, that waiting period is the worst possible experience. It's worse than the actual performance itself in most cases. So what can you do? Well, presuming that you have done the preparation and you're able to talk your way through a piece and you know it backwards, then really what you're focusing on is bringing your body down from that fight or flight state that it gets itself into. So our nervous system is very much involved in our fight and flight response and we need to have means of calming that system down to an appropriate level for the circumstances. If there isn't actually a bear coming at you, there is no need for you to be in a cold sweat and shaking. But we need to get that message to our brain. So one of the best ways to do that is an exercise, a breathing exercise, in which we breathe in for four and breathe out for eight. So a long, slow out breath blowing calms our system down because it's not something you'll do if there's a bear coming at you. Your system gets the message if, the, if you're able to do this it means that okay things actually mustn't be as bad as, as we think. So breathing in for four and out for eight. Blow it on your hand actually and count. And you can make that slower or faster. You needn't fight your breathing too much but just a good breath in and a longer breath out will help. Another quite useful thing to do is to sing inside your head 
because you can't sing and worry at the same time. So if you're busy singing happy birthday to you or something, then, then it, it, it's enough to sort of just keep the anxiety down a little bit while you're, you're distracting yourself essentially. Giving yourself something to do while you're waiting. You can be warming your hands up, making sure that your fingers are ready for the keyboard. And when the time comes that you are actually at the keyboard and starting to play, if you start to shake, you've got to allow it. You can't fight it. The worst thing in the world you can do is to try to quell shaking legs. You can just acknowledge it. If you can bring your focus on to what you're doing, notice that your knees are shaking, your hands are shaking and just go, okay, they're shaking, but I know that I'm playing a G chord next. I'm moving up to C because you've prepared so thoroughly. You do know you'd have memorized those moves and you can focus on that. Bringing your aural memory into play at the same time will also help. The same as singing happy birthday while you're waiting. While you're playing the music, you should be hearing the music. In fact, you should be hearing the music slightly before you play it. And if you can focus on that, that will give you a great advantage in actually producing the music physically. I was always told before exams to eat a banana for the potassium, which is apparently good for nerves. And I've always said that to my own students. And I believe the thinking behind it is that when you're nervous, and your body produces adrenaline. In order for it to produce that adrenaline, it uses up your body's supplies of potassium. And if your potassium levels are low in your body, that produces shakiness. But don't do what apparently one performer did and ate it three bananas before going on for an audition and <laughs> threw up on stage. So maybe don't overdo it, but um, a banana might actually help if you're on your way to perform. But generally speaking, if it's one of your ambitions to actually perform a piece of music for friends or a larger audience, there really won't be any substitute for actually practicing performance and habituating yourself to performance. So the best advice I can give you is really to start doing it. And as I said, with the simplest music you can find. And at any level of performance, performance. You should never be trying to perform something that's at the edge of your own abilities. You should always aim to perform things for people that is several levels below what you're actually working on. So if you're an intermediate player, maybe working on something around grade three, grade four, grade five, really you should not be trying to perform anything that's above a grade one level. If you're a grade seven or grade eight, you know, quite an advanced player, then early intermediate stuff might be at the maximum that, that you can perform at. A simple piece played beautifully is worth far more than a complicated piece that might sound showy, but if it's not delivered accurately or confidently, it won't have the same impact. So really aim always to deliver a piece of music that's well within your ability, but to perform it beautifully. The last bit of advice I want to give you is one that I heard on a TED talk, and I will put the link below this because it's well, it's well worth watching. And again, it's a, a, a concert pianist who went through her own crisis of performance very early in her career and she was told by her teacher when she was getting ready to you know flee the scene before a concert that she wasn't planning on performing because she was so terrified and her teacher told her she was being very selfish and she couldn't understand what am I I'm being selfish I'm terrified here how am I being selfish and he was saying because you've prepared this beautiful music and the music needs to be shared with your audience they are waiting to hear the music it's not about you it's about the music and this brought her back into herself and she realized this is very true. So if you can take yourself out of the equation, having done your preparation, your very thorough preparation, having practiced performance itself, having learned how to calm your nervous system, the last thing to do is to remember to take yourself out of the equation. You're sharing music with an audience and it's the music that wants to be heard. And for most of us, the reason we want to share this music is not because we want the glory of what a great person I am, I'm, I can play this. We want to share the music that we love with other people. We want them to hear something that means so much to us. So take yourself out of the equation, remind yourself that it's about the music and see how much better an experience it becomes. And that's the same regardless of whether you're preparing for a studio recital or for an exam or for an impromptu performance at a party that you're attending. If you have a piece ready, make sure it's something that you love and that when you play it, that's what you're communicating. I hope some of this advice resonates with you. I know it's a, it's a lot to take on because it is a very, very big field and there's been a lot of study actually done on performance anxiety and stage fright. So I've tried to encapsulate it here a little bit. So if you're just starting to think about performance, it might be worth just picking one or two things that you think you can, you can work with. And I would recommend really starting as soon as you can to habituate yourself to performing in a very simple way. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and any experiences you might have had with it and what, what you have found has helped. As regards the preparation, if you haven't already downloaded my practice workbook, there's a link uh, in the top comment below where you can get that. And it basically gives lots of practice techniques that, that I find really useful to help me thoroughly learn a piece of music. So as ever, happy practicing and I'll see you soon.